Welcome everyone. My name is Mark Cowley and I will be the host of today's session which addresses the growing offshore wind industry. This session is kindly sponsored and created by Fugro. We would like to thank them for their support and involvement in this event. Please head over to their exhibition page on the app to find out more about them. The RMRS is committed to offshore renewables and provides a forum through its offshore renewables special interest group which I co-chair with Adeskar Brown. Our activities include routine committee meetings to define the areas we should be working in with input from our corresponding members. This generates online events and working groups. In 2022, we have four main working groups dedicated to offshore wind, people and skills, sustainability and circular economy, and MetOcean. We are also planning a series of panel discussions around offshore skills, consenting, innovation and technologies, health, safety and well-being. You can find us on social media under hash or SIG and can engage with a broader corresponding membership through Nexus as an IMRS member. Offshore renewable energy is an exciting place to be today. Today we are seeing Hexcon's twin hub project awarded a CFD in the Celtic Sea and four tidal stream projects also being awarded CFDs. So it is great to be hosting this session on growing the offshore wind. Our first speaker today is Richard Auckland of 4C Offshore. Richard leads the market research department at 4C Offshore. He is responsible for the strategic development and success of 4C's market leading reports and databases for the offshore wind sector. He has 15 years as an offshore wind analysis and has delivered over 200 reports and consulting projects. Prior to this, he worked in marine fisheries management in the UK and Southern Africa. So I'd like to hand over to Richard to, uh, for his presentation on meeting the challenges for scaling up offshore wind. Thank you, Mark. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Richard Auckland, Director of Research at 4 c Offshore, and uh, I'm going to talk to you about scaling up and the challenges of offshore wind today. So uh, for those of you who don't know us, um, we provide market intelligence and consultancy to the offshore wind market. We have about 2,500 subscribers, and uh, uh, we cover all different technologies related to offshore wind. Um, so let's start with the opportunity. So if you take a look at this colorful waterfall chart, which I'll guide you through, and we look at the bottom left, this is where we are right now. We have 53 gigawatts commissioned. Um, the blue, that's China, it has the most, followed by uh, the UK and then Germany. And if we add in that which is under construction, that takes us up to 70.3 gigawatts. And you can see, once again, it's China, uh, UK predominantly. Then we add on projects that have made a final investment decision, and that takes us to 78 gigawatts. Um, so basically we have 78 gigawatts of offshore wind that has been committed um, or is in, has been built. And then looking through to 2030, we are forecasting another 180 gigawatts, which we expect to be underway by 2030. Um, that takes us to 258 gigawatts, a compound annual growth rate of just under 15%. And you can see with the, where this is going to come from, uh, this additional growth by looking at the markets here. We have a US, China, Germany, UK, Netherlands. And uh, this light blue is the floating fraction. So we're seeing another 15 gigawatts of floating. So that's the... Uh, near term, if you like, near to midterm pipe. We monitor all these projects and have a lot of details in our database, plus additional projects to 2040. Uh, this very hectic looking screen is the to-do list for the developers who want to bid into auctions. A very busy schedule to 2025. Um, this schedule is updated quarterly and each edition these flags have to get a bit smaller because we keep having to push more auctions into the timeline, uh, starting to become a bit of a headache how busy it is. Uh, the blue icons are the floaters. You can see um, there's a few floating auctions lined up 
there's an awful lot of activity going on. Um, we have three main different types of auctions. At the top, these are site leasing auctions where the developer is just targeting um, a lease area. So for example, Intog and the Celtic Sea. Then we have a second group here, power offtake only, where you already have a site and you're looking for uh, offtake agreement. Uh, so revenue for your project. We heard the results today of the UK's allocation round four. Then we have um, the sort of European one competition model where you get both your site and an offtake in a single uh, auction. And then finally down the bottom here, we have some transmission related auctions. Okay, so very busy timetable for everybody in offshore wind. Uh, moving on to the longer term. So post 2030, or listen, basically what the ambitions have been stated by different countries. Um, so looking on the left here, we have the ambitions of the major European markets. We see that, for example, Denmark has recently increased to 21 gigawatts. Uh, the UK is there at 50 gigawatts, including up to five gigawatt of floating. Some countries don't have explicit offshore wind targets. They focus on renewable e electricity. Uh, so keep it more generic. So down here we have Sweden targeting 100% renewables by 2040. Or over in APAC, we've got China with a net zero 2060. Incidentally, China does have state target, province targets. They're just not shown here. Um, and then in America's, uh, Brazil has yet to settle down on a figure, but we've got 110 gigawatt in um, the US. So we've got about 500 gigawatts so of articulated ambition. So that is um, a lot more than uh, what we are, where we are at the moment with the 70 gigawatts committed. Okay, so that's the opportunity. Now let's talk about uh, some of the challenges. Site identification, I've got as number one. We regularly hear of countries coming out with a new ambition saying, we're going to auction three gigawatt uh, next year or uh, this summer even. And this appears to be done without any prior work. And the only route there is to let the developers take choose the sites. And that will has a history of leading to a false start. And we've seen that in a few jurisdictions because if we look at how long this takes, so the Celtic Sea started engagement in uh, 2020, and we expect to see uh, leases awarded late 23. So it's essentially a three year process, and it's really hard to shortcut that. Um, there's a lot of engagement involved with stakeholders and industry, and this, these red boxes here is, is GIS and spatial data work. Um, and that's essentially where we are today. Uh, there's areas of search have just been published this week in July. If I draw your attention onto the right here, we can see how difficult it is. So there's been a three-step process to narrow down potentially suitable areas, shown here, highlighted blue. Blue, more suitable, pink, less suitable. Um, and I tend to think of the Western approach as actually a relatively unused piece of seabed uh, of not particular interest, obviously wrong. Uh, we have 19 hard constraint data sets to consider, 26 um, soft constraints. So hard constraints can be protected wrecks, cable agreements, oil and gas agreements, minerals, aggregates. And for, on the soft side, um, hydrocarbon fields, yachting intensity, et cetera. Uh, to help expedite things, a solution is to, in parallel, do site surveys and more detailed site assessments to help developers feed into their uh, consenting processes. So collect the data for that en route. And that takes us nicely into consenting, um, which is the next time bound problem. Uh, we see here in 2012, there was a change of regime from the Dudgeon and Grace Bank, and we went into these blue projects here under the current system. And uh, most of them were falling within the expected time frame, this, this blue dotted line, until recently when East Anglia Hub, Hornsey Project 3, and these uh, uh, orange ones up the top here off the uh, East Coast 
where I am, uh, took an awful lot longer than the expected time. And all this is because of the cumulative impacts of um, projects all in one area. This has had two main impacts. Um, the first uh, issue is the in combination impacts has environmental effects. So we see that, uh, for example, birds has been a problem for Horn C3 and projects are now having to uh, go through the consenting process using the derogations process, which means that they um, essentially have to compensate for the damage they're causing through some human interaction, for example, by building uh, kitty wake nesting sites in the case of Hornsey Project 3. And for these orange ones, which east, each are coming through East Anglia, uh, the onshore grid cumulative impacts has upset the locals and um, caused challenge, legal challenges to the consent process. Okay, moving on. Um, Sorry, just to highlight, there are plans to speed up consenting in the work, trying to get it back to uh, one year, uh, although not much clarity on that yet. Um, grid connections have become a problem. It's very difficult now to get a grid connection this side of 2030. In fact, it's impossible unless you are part of a, a holistic network design. So you can see that what's happened is that uh, the projects around the UK have been do, using these black radial connections that I'm sure you're aware of. You can see on the the, uh, the map here. And um, the Offshore Transmission Network Review has the unenviable, unenviable task of creating a coordinated grid design for all the uh, remaining projects, particularly those in the Round 4 and Scotland and the Celtic Sea. This is a very complicated optioneering task that involves evaluating multiple design options, so available transmission technology, interconnection points, um, in-service dates of different projects, technical challenges, HVDC technology, costs, uh, supply chain readiness, et cetera. It has been delayed, this plan. It was due Q1, and in fact, it was due again last week and in the second timetable, and then again today, uh, and I haven't seen it yet. I've had my eyes open. So I'll be interested to see what that looks like and if that appeases some of the objections. Okay, a solution here perhaps to other countries is to think about maybe bigger projects is a way forward with fewer onshore connections. So for example, one five gigawatt project will have one connection versus um, four one gigawatt projects. The next problem, sustainable supply chains. We've seen a rapid pace of development why has that been the case? Um, because developers have been forced through competition for CFDs to bring down the levelized cost of energy. And turbine size is, there, is the key tool for bringing down that cost. But as a result, the turbine OEMs have struggled to recoup investment costs. Their turbine models have um, quickly been surpassed. They've had production challenges. And consequently, we're now seeing low profitability and losses in the turbine supply chain. The vessels face related similar problems. Um, it's very hard for a vessel operator to uh, invest in a new build with the uncertainty on uh, how big the turbines are going to be. This vessel will become obsolete quite quickly. And at $300 million plus, it's quite an investment. Similarly, the equipment for lifting and installing monopiles uh, can go out of date quickly. For example, um, back down here, not so long ago, really, uh, on the left, monopiles used to weigh 400 tonnes. Now they weigh 2,200 tonnes. And there's quotes in the market for 4,000 tonnes. Um, what are the solutions? We could hit the pause button on the size of the foundations. That will be challenging. I'm not sure who would commit to that, where that would come into regulations. Or a second option perhaps is to avoid competing on cost and thereby have more power in the supply chain. How can you do that? Well, finishing off with this slide, looking at some trends about where we are now and how the market might evolve. Um, the past is not the future. 
The past was characterized in the left hand side here, the green line, by relatively low and relatively stable electricity prices um, and costly uh, offshore wind projects, the blue ones here, that were subsidized by the CFD. Um, the green line to the right shows the future, or well, the present and the future, and we can see that the prices since COVID and the Ukraine crisis have become increasingly volatile such that, and high, such that now the payments reverse order, such that the generator will be paying back the uh, government for its CFD. So right now, you're better off without CFD. But it's very difficult for you to reach financial close without CFD because you need predictable uh, long-term stable revenues and who knows where the price is going. However, we are seeing a large increase in demand and more favorable offtake terms for corporate PPPAs, leading to hybrid CFD and corporate PPA financing becoming more common, as we have seen with this allocation round. Economies are starting to decarbonize through electrification, and we can expect to see demand for hydrogen and other e-fuels begin to emerge for those harder to abate sectors. Indeed, the margins are eroding for simple electricity generation into single digits now. It is no longer enough in the mature markets to compete um, simply in the future. The offshore wind developer of the future is likely to be involved in a more complex world involving electrons and molecules, storage, flexible generation, and trading, serving a range of corporate and public offtakers, all of whom are currently setting net zero goals. So several companies are currently aligning themselves towards this end. For example, SSE, BP, Shell, and RWE are four examples of emerging new generation of integrated energy companies. Okay, thank you. I hope you've managed to take some useful information from that. That's my presentation. Uh, stop sharing. Thanks very much, Richard. Very interesting. Some, uh... Very good points there, and some uh, both opportunities and challenges were well described. Uh, our next speaker is Walter Maas, uh, the Solution Director for Offshore Wind Operation and Maintenance of Fugro. Walter has over a decade of experience in the energy sector and is committed to reducing the levelized cost of wind energy. As a Solution Director of Offshore Wind o and Arthur is leading the development of Fugro's inspection and monitoring services, which support operational wind farms to implement predictive maintenance strategies until end of lifetime and beyond. As a father of two boys, Wato is committed to take the lead in the energy transition by combining technical ingenuity with data-driven decision-making. So I'll pass over to you, Wato. Thanks a lot, Mark, and uh, thanks a lot, Richard, for setting the scene here a little bit. Um, thank you all for joining. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. And uh, I will share my screen a little bit. Uh, so over the next uh, 10 minutes or so, uh, I would like to explain to you a little bit uh, also some of the challenges that we see around maintaining all these wind farms that we are putting into operation. Right, I think uh, Richard already explained that it's challenging enough to, to meet, let's say, the growing demand in terms of consenting. Uh, but once the wind farms are there, we also have to make sure that they deliver up their promises. Uh, and that's where I think within Fugro, we are working hard to uh, develop our remote uh, technologies, which we think can help actually also meet the demands in the growing industry uh, for all the turbines and operations. Good, so let's kick it off. Um, I have a small agenda uh, prepared for you today. Um, first of all, uh, explain a bit, a little bit, why do we change towards remote operations? Uh, a little bit about the technology that we have at hand at Fugro. Uh, then I will focus a bit more on the benefits of remote operations. Uh, and then also I have uh, yeah, a few slides in terms of what are the next steps that we have within the company uh, to develop this further. So why change to remote operations? I think it's fair to say that the world is changing faster than ever before. I think Richard already pointed out uh, some of the key challenges around the Ukraine crisis, the COVID crisis, 
uh, all countries are looking for security of supply and all countries are also looking for solutions to combat climate change. Uh, so there are a lot of changes happening in the world, both in terms of technology development, um, but also in terms of demands that workforces are, are, are put on their employer, uh, let alone also uh, that it's more difficult actually to find the right people uh, to actually come work in this sector, uh, which is a tremendous challenge. So within Figaro, I think uh, we believe that the future is just not about more, it also has to be about better, right? So how can we change our ways of working uh, in such a way that actually we can, uh, well, uh, help basically the, uh, the workforce and, and help the owner operators to, to uh, maintain their assets in the right way. So focusing on the O&M solution of Fugro, uh, I think this solution is in, well initiated to tackle four of the key industry challenges. So the first one is something that Richard already pointed out as well, uh, is with this tremendous increase in turbine uh, power, so uh, the rate of power of the turbines, uh, the increased impact of, of downtime is also growing rapidly, right? So you can imagine if a three megawatt turbine uh, goes offline versus a 16 megawatt turbine uh, has a, a, a difference in terms of impact um, which means that actually you want to inspect those turbines more regularly to ensure that they actually are in a good condition uh, and uh, that you don't have, let's say, any unexpected failures or, or, or downtime associated with that. We see also a, a tremendous increase in lifetime, right? So before you saw well, lifetime expectations of around 20 years, uh, but actually, after the subsidy period was was run out, uh, a lot of a lot of wind farms were already repowered, uh, and now all of a sudden, with this new technology, we're expecting those turbines to last for 25 years. But already, 30 years and 30 35 years are actually being discussed uh, to further reduce the levelized cost of energy. So, how do you ensure that? Right? How do you collect the right data over the lifetime? to actually uh, uh, be able to assess uh, how much years of operation and the asset has still has left. Uh, that's something that we can address in our inspection and monitoring solution. We also see an increased pressure to reduce operational expenditure. Again, uh, I think Richard pointed out that there's a, a huge competition around costs. Uh, so also we have to be smart about uh, how we actually send people offshore and how do we actually um, optimize the activities that we need to do in the offshore wind uh, space. And last but not least, uh, I think there's also an increased pressure to become carbon neutral and biodiversity positive, right? So it's nice that we are uh, developing uh, renewable energy, uh, but if we still have to spend an enormous amount of, of carbon actually to install those assets and then also to maintain those assets uh, that that's in the in the long run not acceptable anymore to the wider public at the same time you also see uh, uh, some ambitions like the one uh, in the Netherlands where where I am actually uh, have my residence you see that 72 gigawatts by 2050 actually would mean that almost the entire North Sea will be full of wind farms going forward so we, we, we need to be able to combine it also with uh, nature purposes, and we need to also monitor that carefully uh, to ensure uh, that we do the right things and, and, and help the biodiversity in the marine environment. So what is some of the technology that we have available then to do that? It all centers around our concept of remote operation centers. So with the remote operation centers, it basically means that we have a room full of screens uh, where uh, we actually collect uh, and, and communicate with uh, all the assets that we have offshore. It can be uh, that we are collecting the data from some of our traditional vessels, uh, but it also uh, is collecting all the information around our uncrewed service vessels, which I will explain you a bit more about in the next slide. Um, and these, um, uncrewed service vessels are actually uh, fully operated out of our remote operation center. Uh, so there's nobody offshore and, and uh, there's somebody actually steering uh, this little vessel here, including the ROV, 
uh, to do any type of subsea inspections uh, in the field. The big advantage actually to the, of this remote operations uh, setup is that all the data automatically also flows into the cloud and that's, that we actually can have a, a quicker way of accessing this, this data as well. So looking a little bit more at the uh, actual fleet that we have available. So for operation maintenance, we, we have uh, two USV models. Uh, currently we have an operation, uh, the so-called Blue Essence. It's a 12 meter uh, USV with an onboard ROV. Currently we have the Blue Volta, uh, specially designed uh, remote operated vehicle, which is on board of this improved service vessel. Uh, Electric, uh, it's electrical uh, and specifically designed also to, to be able to operate it uh, uh, offshore. And then we are working on the, the Blue Eclipse, which is the next version. It's an 18 meter USV, which has a slightly longer endurance and also a, a slightly higher uh, operating window, um, which will contain a, a slightly stronger version of the ROV, which we call the Blue Amp. Uh, which is also flexible to accommodate any kind of different skits that we can put on to, uh, under these uh, ROVs uh, for any kind of uh, task that we need to do uh, offshore. And just to show you a little bit that that's, uh, this is um, well, not only theory, but only practice, uh, also practice that we already have this thing in operation. I have a, a quick clip, clip of the uh, Oceanology uh, Conference where we showcase the USB and ROV. Just to show you that this thing is real and it's uh, so this is in the harbour of London. Uh, and this is then in Aberdeen, a remote operation centre. Uh, and actually, the full thing is operated out of Aberdeen, uh, but live in uh, in London. Um, I made a statement uh, that you get 80% of the cap capability uh, against 5% of the fuel use with zero people on board. Um, I made a statement 80% because it's compared to a traditional uh, uh, ROV supply vessel. Uh, there might be some activities that we cannot do with a 12 meter USV, uh, but the advantages is actually uh, that you save a lot of fuel and that you actually reduce uh, the number of people on board. So, Moving on to the benefits of uh, remote operations. I already mentioned the view uh, throughout my presentation, uh, but essentially it it's boils down around these three themes. Uh, remote operations uh, with a figure we believe that it's safer, faster, and more sustainable. Safer because actually compared to a traditional uh, ROV supply vessel, uh, we have zero people on board and a traditional ROV supply vessel has around 35 people on board, uh, which means that you actually um, well, create a, a safe working environment, but also a more accessible working environment. I mean, with the whole COVID crisis, uh, you also see that people uh, get, are getting used to working from home or people actually would like to work from home uh, because they also want, would like to have a, a, a better work-life balance. Uh, sending people offshore for weeks in a row uh, is something completely different than actually sending somebody into the remote operation center, uh, which actually means that we can open up this, this workspace for uh, uh, well, a different uh, uh, targeted audience, also meeting the demands of the uh, growing number of employees that we need in this business. The second theme is around faster. Right, so traditionally you saw that, that reports were being delivered uh, after a couple of weeks, um, meaning that actually after a couple of weeks you realized, hey, I might have an issue here uh, with my uh, depth of burial or uh, an issue here with uh, my corrosion on, on this monopile. Uh, we can actually bring that down to a couple of hours. In fact, we can actually give you almost direct access to the video footage that we are collecting uh, with the ROV because uh, our remote operation center is also capable of, of uh, actually having a live feed. So to expand a little bit on this, this, this faster uh, principle, it, it goes hand in hand with what we call with a our triple A approach, where we acquire data, we analyze it, and we uh, deliver advice based on that. Um, and by doing uh, 
uh, everything remotely, uh, we actually can process the acquired data uh, faster and in a single cloud environment, which means that the data that we're collecting can actually be analyzed in real time uh, and also cross-reference with any other data that we have or that you might have uh, as a client uh, to make sure that we actually combine it in such a way that we can deliver the right advice at the right time. Um, all of this can be done through an, uh, a cloud app or a web browser, uh, meaning that you can access the data anywhere, anytime. And then last but not least, uh, it's way more sustainable, right? So currently we see that uh, the fuel consumption of a traditional RV supply vessel uh, lies around 7,000 liter uh, per day compared to 200 liters what we are spending on the USV which means a 95% reduction in fuel use, which is huge, right? Uh, and at the same time, uh, if we increase, let's say the um, electrical charging infrastructure at sea, uh, we have the potential to quickly change this around uh, to a complete carbon neutral solution going forward. So what does the future uh, look like uh, for, for us within Fugro? I think, first of all, we currently have three uncrewed service vessels in operations, uh, and we are heavily expanding that into, into the future. We're also looking into, okay, can we add an aerial drone, drone capability onto that? Uh, and we are looking into, okay, how can we further reduce the CO2, the CO2 footprint uh, of our USVs, uh, including also this other full electrical option. Around our remote operations centers, are we really focusing on creating a diverse and inclusive environment? Um, we have our remote operations centers uh, strategically lo located around uh, the world. Um, and we are working hard to automate a lot of the data collection processes uh, to even faster analyze and, 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 and turn the data into advice anywhere, uh, anytime, uh, also importing uh, to the client's wishes. And then last but not least, uh, we also uh, are uh, developing a concept which we call internally RoboDoc, which is a remote fueling uh, and data offload station, uh, which is basically a, a docking station for the USV, uh, which also is operated fully remotely. Uh, currently, it's, it's placed in a harbor, uh, but in the future, we can also place that uh, at any wind farm offshore. Uh, meaning that you can also uh, have a resident USV in a certain area uh, and after a, a big storm event or another weather event, you, you quickly can actually uh, deploy the USB to check if your assets is still in a good shape. So that's a bit uh, an intro to uh, offshore wind O&M within Fugro. Um, there's a nice video clip actually uh, on the BBC uh, uh, Click uh, channel. Uh, there's a link uh, in this slide, or you can also scan the, um, uh, the QR code. Uh, and if there are any questions, uh, please let me know also by the platform. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Rata. Um, as well as addressing how things improve in terms of delivering green energy, it's, it's great that you address the question of reducing energy demand, because uh, I think that's a key one Okay. Yeah. Not, not just for corporations, but for individuals to actually try to reduce their energy demands as much as they can to uh, to address the climate issue. Fully agree. Um, okay, our next speaker is Ed Walker of the Exodus Group. Ed is a marine energy specialist with specific experience in the assessment, consenting and development of marine based infrastructure projects. A chartered environmentalist, chartered marine technologist, and chartered water and environmental manager, Ed has experience working on a range of marine based, nationally significant infrastructure projects, including offshore wind and subsea transmission, transmission cables. Ed will talk to the challenges and opportunities on the road to net zero. And over to you, Ed. Thanks. Thank you. Mark, I'll just share my screen. Hopefully that's uh, that's working. So yeah, today I'm going to talk about some of the, the challenges and opportunities around net zero. Um, 
brief overview of the areas that I'd like to cover. Strategic context, so setting the um, the, the scene uh, for for today's talk. Um, I'd like to look at some of the UK successes, um, some of the challenges that are, that are coming up and how they might be managed, and then tail off with um, how we exploit opportunities in the uh, in the sector. Um, yeah, views of my own and uh, the materials that are within the presentation are based on publicly available information. Uh, so net zero carbon emissions by 2050 and 2045 in, in Scotland is obviously at the forefront of, of all of our minds. Um, and likewise, the drive towards decarbonisation of the energy system. So a move away from um, conventional sources of energy and um, also, the, uh, the the electrification of our uh, our transport system is uh, is, is is notable, um, and this is set to increase from twenty thirties onward. Um, also, electrification of heat is notable. So, we're um, starting to use more heat pumps, for example. So that's a, an air source heat pump in the picture that you can see. Um, and that's also expanding into the um, the commercial realm um, too. So there's an evolving North Sea um, in, the, in around the around the UK. So I wouldn't say kind of oil and gas is is stopping far far from it. It's still recognised as being um, an important part of our, our energy mix um, as we make that transition um, to net zero. Um, but yeah, it is it is certainly changing. Um, and then last but not least, there is a rapidly growing UK supply chain, uh, which is sort of looking to meet some of the requirements of the, the offshore wind sector. Um, Richard and, and, uh, and others touched on some of the challenges around that earlier. Um, so in terms of successes to date, well, the UK is a global leader in conventional offshore wind. We've got the largest capacity globally, so around 10 gig. Um, 4C might correct me on that. They've probably got more intelligence than uh, than me, but that's that's broadly where we're we're at at the moment. Um, we've seen some rapid cost reductions in this sector, um, and in the UK, we we do enjoy or have enjoyed good governmental support for for this um, this this technology. Um, that, along with other factors, has led to turbine size and performance evolving um, quite quite swiftly. Um, to the stage where we're we're looking at, at, at really quite quite large turbines now, um, and that 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 increase has been been rapid. So in terms of challenges, um, there are various challenges within the supply chain. Some of which we've, we've touched on already today. Turbine manufacturing is a big one. Vessel vessel shortages, which I think is only likely to increase with turbine sizes, um, and yeah, that's a bit of a bit of a challenge to, to sort of keep up with um, the rapid evolution of, of, um, of turbine components and capacities. High voltage cables, I think we talked a little bit about that in the uh, in the introductions, um, but this is a, a big challenge that components um, come from around the world, often comprising precious metals, which are um, scarce and, and in demand. Um, port infrastructure, so the, the, the volume of offshore wind deployment is, is absolutely vast. Um, see, today we've, we've seen the press releases from from Orsted, or some of us may have seen the press releases from Orsted on the um, the, the largest uh, largest offshore wind farm um, being being given um, C, CFD. Um, so yeah, how do we how do we uh, cater for for that that development through our ports? Onshore challenges. So talked a bit about grid connections earlier. Um, if we look at the example of Scotwind, there are many different projects all around the Scottish coast. Will they all individually get landfalls and grid connections? No, that's highly unlikely um, based on the, the, the current approach of connection to, um, to the grid. And last but not least, a really big one is workforce. So looking at this in a little bit more detail, um, there are potential, well, significant potential skills shortages, considering the offshore wind targets that we have. That's both in terms of 
um, sort of fabrication and installation technology for today's solutions, but also for next gen solutions. So floating is a, a good example, um, or offshore wind paired with with hydrogen, um, which we'll we'll touch on later as well. Um, more broadly, there is a big skill shortage at the moment in terms of consenting and planning. What are we doing to address that? Um, probably need to be getting into schools and universities to emphasize the need for for this um this set of skills um more so than we're, we're doing at the moment i i would think spatial pressures so this is a huge one 4c 4c touched on this earlier but we have an extremely busy marine environment so this figure is from an east coast study um, which was carried out by the crown estate with support from acom so in this particular figure there's shipping, commercial fisheries activity, aggregate extraction activity, subsea transmission, recreational users, and some Ministry of Defence areas um, to boot. So quite a lot going on in that, that East Coast region. And it's also one of the most yeah, busy areas of, um, of, of the UK in terms of the marine environment. Alongside that, this figure depicts how heavily designated that area is in terms of environmental protection. So that area is, you know, particularly sensitive. So development can understandably be, be sort of likely to be subjected to just to kind of immense scrutiny. So how do we balance the need for low carbon energy, deploy offshore wind at scale, avoid or not or don't disrupt other marine users and also be sensitive to the, the marine environment? That, that's yeah, a huge challenge. So coming on from that, then the consenting process is also a, a major challenge, I would suggest. So in terms of baseline data collection, uh, it's actually challenging to sometimes get the, the required permissions to go out and collect data. Um, a lot of surveys can be carried out without the need for permits and licenses, but some do require licenses and permits and that, that itself can be, um, can be quite challenging to obtain. Um, there's also the challenge around expectations on what that data includes and its scope and quality, which yeah needs needs sort of careful management with um, with the marine regulators and, and stakeholders. Competing stakeholder demands. So I think in the case of marine licensing, there are so many different consultees to a marine decision. It's probably very difficult to please all of the people um, all of the time with that that process. Resource capability and experience is a big one. So um, it's quite hard at the moment in the sector. Um, I should imagine for the regulators to retain staff based on the sort of opportunities that, that are available. And I think making sure that there's capability within the, the, the regulator is, is quite key. Complexity of environmental impact assessment. So EIA has generally sort of increased and increased and increased in scope and complexity over recent years. So how do we maybe try and put the brakes on that slightly and try and ensure proportionate EIA? Accelerating consenting is key to managing this challenge, but how do we do that? And also how do we balance competing pressures within the marine stakeholders? Well, we'll touch on that shortly. One potential silver bullet, if you like, could be floating wind. So there are a number of different designs or probably kind of upwards of 50 different individual um, specific designs, but they all broadly share um, or they broadly fit into one of one of four um, archetypes, if you like. Um, floating can help access deeper water further offshore. So accessing higher winds and greater generation. Touching on the consenting risk piece that we just talked about well if we can get further offshore can we avoid some of the inshore pressures and have a smoother path to a consent floating offshore wind may in many cases be more straightforward to install so does that equate to a faster installation perhaps um, or are there different uh, vessel requirements which make this make this process easier um, in terms of Benefits, well, Ori Catapult um, have carried out independent research, which would suggest that there's a massive UK benefit by 2050 
um, from this this technology um, and environmentally um, in the vast majority of aspects we can expect a lower environmental impact from the installation process itself by virtue of the fact that floating doesn't have a, um, a fixed foundation in the same way that a, a conventional turbine would it's more of a, an anchor and a tether solution so looking around the uk at the moment this depicts some of the scotwind results and also um, some of the intog areas which is focused on oil and gas decarbonization again floating offshore wind technology um, in blythe northumberland there is a project which edf progressing looking to decarbonize there with five floating offshore wind turbines and hot off the press this week you may have already seen it but the crown estates press release confirming the um the celtic sea uh, areas of, of interest um, down in the southwest, again, floating offshore wind. This figure here depicts um, a timeline for floating offshore wind projects. So it's an exodus um, piece of market intelligence. The, the reason for sharing it is that, you know, if you look at where we've come from and where in particular where we're going many of the forthcoming floating offshore wind projects are, are going to be uk based so there's lots of opportunity and there's lots of challenge particularly in the uk for this this technology so how do we exploit some of the other opportunities well in terms of accelerating consenting early stakeholder engagement is is really key um, and making sure that stakeholders are, are brought on board as soon as possible meaningful pre-application engagement, solution-focused approaches, trying not to get frustrated about timeframes and issues with regulators and their consultees, trying to work with them to help inform their decision. Proportionality, touched on this before in terms of environmental impact assessment, but it's key that we have proportionate assessments that aren't overly long or, or overly complex. And then linked to that point is helping industry develop consensus on non-issues. We'll talk about that a little bit later in terms of floating. Um, but as well as that, drawing on, pa on past experience, what has worked well for previous major infrastructure, for example, how can we apply that to the projects of the future? And strategic collaboration. Um, we'll talk about that at a couple of slides time. Um, but looking at the network of the future and how offshore wind integrates into it is another key point. As the UK shifts away from oil and gas, there's a big opportunity for a workforce transition. Opportunities relate to offshore wind, yes, but also a lot of other low carbon technologies. And I think there's a clear opportunity for a skills, knowledge and expertise um, transition in for, from oil and gas um, and bringing that, um, bringing that knowledge to, to, to help speed up um, offshore wind deployment. An example of this in action is Aberdeen, so Europe's oil capital, which is now home to the European Offshore Wind Development Centre, Scotland's largest test and development site, High Wind Floating Offshore Wind Hub, uh, and various other wider associated development. Um, Aberdeen Harbour, Turbine um, O&M facility, the, yeah, the list goes on. So conscious of time, um, I'll also quickly just talk about X Academy. So. This is a world first skills transition initiative, which is focused on developing knowledge, skills and experience required for the energy transition. So it's led by Exodus with support from um, other partners as displayed. And yeah, it's basically a non for profit uh, organization reinvesting training into um, further skills development, which is yeah a really interesting thing to, to, to be involved in um, and quite critical, I think. So more coordination but what does that look like well with the development of multi-point interconnectors more coordinate coordination and shared landfalls um, such as in this image that's being depicted here we can see um, multiple uh, offshore wind farms connecting into an offshore network including hydrogen hubs um, carbon capture utilization and storage is the potential for co-location with offshore wind that's another interesting, interesting point. Um, but I think with this in particular, floating offshore wind is potentially particularly 
well suited to integration with multiple interconnectors because they can interconnect or interlink into that MPI um, at multiple points along the offshore network because they're not restricted by um, the usual sort of depth issues with conventional offshore wind. So again, conscious of time, drawing to a close. Um, there are lots of different challenges. Um, I think it's critical for them to be addressed openly and, and tackled head on through collaboration within the, the IMRS community. I think there's a need for a change in mindset. So greater collaboration with regulatory bodies rather than a, a sort of them and us position. There are significant opportunities, both technically and in terms of workforce. Um, I think that it's key as we move away from uh, oil and gas, gradually shift away from that to apply lessons learned from that very well understood sector um, to next generation proposals. And that also applies to taking lessons learned from offshore wind to floating offshore wind. Um, I think to help address that, that skills gap that we're, we're seeing, encouragement and support is, is vital, particularly to those who are entering into, um, entering into this career. Um, so, yeah, just about on time, that leaves me to say thank you very much um, for the opportunity to present today and happy to take questions um, later on in the session. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ed. Uh, some really poignant points made there. Um, I just mentioned that from uh, an IMRS perspective, one of the key things we're trying to do is encourage people in into the sector through uh, See Your Future, where we've created careers matrices, trying to uh, allow people to understand what skills they need to enter the sector. And we also have some profiles of people who, who have entered the sector and moved up through the sector. So uh, give people ideas of how they move forward. Um, I had a few other things I was gonna pick up on, but I, I'll perhaps save those for the uh, discussion section. So our final speaker of this session is Ross McFarlane. Ross is the Remote Operations Program Manager at Fugro. After completing his cadetship, Ross dis decided to explore different aspects of the maritime industry, taking up a position as a fleet training officer with Northern Marine Management. He then decided to go back to sea and worked offshore for SWA Pacific as a navigation DP officer before moving on to be a project safety officer with Royal Caribbean. After joining Fugro and taking up the position of US V Policy and Public Affairs Advisor, where he led the regulatory affairs for the company's new autonomous ships, as well as worked to reshape the human machine relationship by identifying the newly required skill sets of the evolving workforce to enable safe and efficient operations. His current role as remote operations program manager for the Middle East brings together all the components which have defined his career so far. And Ross's focus is now on ensuring a safe and effective implementation of all Fugro's remote offerings in the region. Over thanks, Mark. Um, thanks everybody and thank you for having me here today. Um, I'm in a fortunate position today where I don't have to explain but grow to you. I don't have to explain what operations because Wouter's just done that for me. Um, so I'm going to dial in and it, it ties quite nicely to, to the end of Ed's presentation, actually, because I'm purely going to talk about skills here um, and talking about the, the autonomous vessels, which uh, which Wouter was talking about earlier. So first of all, I'd just like to show you the, the, the Gartner hype cycle. So basically, <clears throat> this is a process of identifying the, the hype cycle around innovation. So whenever some new technology enters the market, everybody gets really excited about it. They think it's going to change the world. Um, lots of people get scared that they're going to lose their jobs and the world that you wake up in tomorrow is going to be totally different. And then after, after a little short period of time, you sort of realise that that's not the case. It's not quite as great as you think it's going to be. It's, it's revolutionary, but not quite as revolutionary as everybody first believed. And I think the maritime industry in particular sort of over that peak now and people are starting to realise that remote and autonomous vessels, while they're still very impressive, aren't going to all of a sudden change the way we work and we're going to wave ships off at a port and see, see them three weeks later. Uh, and hopefully they've done what it was we were we sent them out to do. Um, so uh, uh, it's a little bit obscure, but let me start with this. So basically, if, you, if, you, if we think about autonomous cars, 
what we're doing is teaching them to drive on the road. And if you look at a picture, if you look at this picture of the road, you know, there's markings, there's a clear area where they've got to operate. Um, further down the road, there'll be road signs where they can, uh, which will sort of guide them and what they're supposed to do. They'll come to a set of traffic lights, which will tell them to stop. And we can teach them to recognize these, these um, signs and markings. And it's a learned behavior that it's relatively, it's not straightforward, but it's, it's, it's a confined environment, essentially, which we can teach them. All of a sudden, you've got a snowy day and all those markings are gone. Then what, then what does the car do? Um, I think, as we've all seen from, from the tests that have been going on around the world of autonomous cars, is that it's actually more difficult than we thought it was going to be to teach them to, be, to drive themselves. And it's things like this. Robots really work best in an environment that's designed for them. If you design it purely for them and take the human out of the equation completely, then that's when they function best. You know, they, they can they can interact with each other. They can they know exactly the environment where they're working in, and they can they can they can do the function which they're programmed to do. Unfortunately, we work in this environment, which is even more removed from the the roads where autonomous cars are working. Um, and the other element is the is the other people. You know, there's still going to be other ships which are crewed. And you, might, you never know how they're going to react. So we, it's, it's almost impossible, essentially, at the moment, to teach that, teach that behaviour 100% of the time that a ship's going to do what we expect it to do. So what does that mean for us when we're talking about the, the remote and autonomous ships that, that Figaro are starting to implement now and other companies are starting to implement? It's essentially the tip of the iceberg, basically. The technology is that bit that we can see above the surface and everybody loves talking about. It's the collision avoidance systems, the vessels which can take decisions on their own, the ones that when you lose connection to it, it can go to a predetermined location or, or come back to port. Unfortunately, that's not the whole picture, though. There's this other element beneath the surface where we have a whole bunch of sensors which give uh, situational awareness, both to the vessel and also to the person who's making sure that that vessel is doing what it's supposed to be doing. The other element of it is the, the control systems making sure that the, the information which is being sent back to the shore is, is sufficient enough and giving enough information that the person can take action before anything happens. So basically what I'm trying to show with this is that whilst the technology is amazing and it is going to change the way that their industry works, it's not the whole picture. Um, and I think we're starting to get to that point where people are realising that and realising that we have a skills gap to make up because we've changed the way that we're going to work. People are now going to work from the shore, as you saw from Wouter's presentation in remote operations centres. Um, so we need to make sure that those people that are going to work in remote operations centres have the skills in order to do what it is that uh, the person on board the vessel would normally do. So by that, we start to talk about the human in the loop. And you'll ask the question, what do we mean by the human in the loop? Now, there, there's two variations of this, so I'll, I'll talk through both of them. But essentially, we have a data source coming in that data source then goes into a, a storage location. Um, so these data sources are camera feeds, AIS feeds, it could be sensors, um, picking up uh, information about the seabed, the sen et cetera, et cetera. So that's all, that all comes into the system and where it's stored. From that point, when we're talking about these, the, the, the future, where we're going to be, that then goes into this AI decision model. And that decision model takes a decision and gives an output whether that's it detects another vessel, so it decides to take an alteration to avoid it, or um, it notices that it, it's, that it's in an area where it's not supposed to be, so it'll, it'll move out of there, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, the systems aren't that smart yet. That's where the humans introduced. And the, there's sort of, the, the, as I said, there's two variations of this, so I'll talk through the other variation of this in a second, but this is the, the verification stage to make sure that that model is taking the decision, the correct decision. Um, there's collision regulations, which are the, the, the rules of the sea in order that you have to utilize in order to navigate. So there's a whole bunch of parameters from which any decision based, uh, any decision needs to be based upon, and we need to make sure that it's making correct decisions. The advantage of that at the moment is that that can then teach the model so we can help them get smarter. So we're, we're gradually moving towards this, this situation where hopefully we can take the human out of the loop and put them on the loop um, where they're not actively involved, but still monitoring. Um, but as I said, this is just one version of what we're looking at today. The other alternative 
puts the human back in that, that decision-making model. So they have an enhanced decision process because they're getting more data than they would have had before through decision support. So augmented reality, virtual reality, all of these sorts of things are starting to enhance the human um, rather than the human babysitting, as I suppose, the, 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 the systems that are making the decisions. Um, but I think the key point through all of these is that the human is critical at the moment and will be for, I think, for as long as we can, as long as we can expect to operate, as long as I think as long as I alive, we're never going to be um, fully reliant on vessels. Um, one of my colleagues, uh, Gordon Meadow, always says that Captain Kirk was still on the bridge of the Enterprise, which I think sums it up perfectly. So if we're talking about keeping that human in the loop, the next question, I guess, is who is that human? Is it someone that exists today? Is it a, a communication specialist? Is it a marine engineer, an IT technician, a navigation officer, or an electronic specialist? And I think the answer to this is, at the moment, these people are all still involved in, in, in their own individual ways. And we have to make sure that they're, they all work together, which is the beauty of remote operation centers where they can all come together in one space rather than, you know, uh, having being spread across, being on board the vessel and being ashore. They're all together now, which I think is, is key to making it a success for the short term, short term. But looking more longer term, I think essentially that the person who's going to be filling this role is, is, a, is a combination of all of these skills it's maybe not going to be one person who's a specialist in everything. You're still going to have people who specialize in individual skills, but there's going to be an element of all of these people in that one person. They're going to have a, a broad knowledge, which allows them to, to take decisions and be involved in ensuring that systems are operating the way that they're supposed to be operating. So in order to, to, to go through this process, what we did at Fugro was we, we started by identifying the information on the way that we we're going to operate uh, mass, which is maritime autonomous surface systems. We looked at the different vessels which we were building and planning to build, and we looked at the way that we plan to operate that. So whether it be from somebody standing on board a vessel driving a, driving a ship with a remote control, or whether it's someone sitting 3,000 miles away in a, in a container driving a, driving a vessel that's, that's 200 miles offshore. Um, from that, we then looked at compiling task statements. So we looked at the actual functions that those people were going to be doing. Um, that then allowed us to create job profiles. So actually, from the last slide, creating what those people actually looked like. And from that, we took it and compared it against current standards. So for, uh, for USV operators, we took it and uh, benchmarked it against SDCW. For uh, engineering, we, we looked at engineering standards and um, IT and comms uh, competencies to look at which elements of uh, which elements currently exist and essentially what's missing, and that allowed us to to develop these new people um, and the new competencies which were going to be required. Um, specifically, talking about uh, vessel operations, we we approached a number of partners and um, mass people was formed. Now. Mass people is primarily focused on the navigation side of things at the moment, but um, there is a plan to look at other elements later on. And the idea is that we're working to, to, to sort of secure that technology people partnership and um, provide those competencies into international legislation. So to, to standardize the industry, essentially, which I think is key as we start to move forward. The other element of this is that generally when you talk about international standards, the people and skills are the last things which are which are always um, looked at. They always identify how, how systems are developed and built safely, but and what standards they're built to, but the, the actual operation of them is always sort of an afterthought. So this time we brought it to the forefront, and as we go through this transition, people are, are front and centre throughout the whole thing. Um, so the idea of mass people is that we'll, we'll look at skills and training try to develop new routes into the industry to encourage new people, develop career paths for people that are already in the industry to, to move forward and um, support those, ensure that there's support for those that are still in, in operating in conventional methods, essentially. I think the, the other element, which I don't touch on too much in this presentation, but is that essentially 
through this transition, we're going to open the doors for new people to be able to come into the industry who have never been able to go to see before, be that because um, because of the work-life balance or because the, physically they, they couldn't go to see. So essentially, we're really expanding our horizons within the maritime industry and really ho hopefully we can get a new new generation through the doors. Um, so yeah, so briefly just to sum up, I think the whole point of what I'm trying to get across today is that as we start to talk about these new ways of working, these new markets which we're moving into, the new which ways in which we're going to cater for them, the people need to remain front and centre essentially. Um, as I said, whether that be from sitting in the back deck of a vessel driving with the remote control or if they're um, sitting in a container somewhere um, controlling a vessel that's, that's 200 miles away from them or if they're sitting in a full remote operation centre which is controlling vessels all over the world. The people are still in those centres and we need to make sure that they're fully catered for and that they have the skills in order to do their jobs to the same high standards which they're expected to complete today um, and I think even increase the standards to make sure that the, the, the risk to life, the rest of the environment and the rest of the assets is, is even further reduced. Um, and just to, to, to finish off, I guess I just wanted to leave you with this quote from Steve Jobs, which is that essentially the technology is nothing. What's important is the people and the technology is the tool to allow them to do wonderful things. I think this is really really key as we move forward and, and making sure that as cool as the technology is and as much as we like talking about it we don't forget the people that's behind it and make sure that they are equipped to fully take advantage of, of what this new technology is going to allow them to do and um, sorry it was short and sweet but i hope uh, i managed to give some insight there into the people and skill side of things thank you very good, Ross. Thanks very much. Um, I think we'll dive straight into the, the panel discussion um, based on the most popular question appearing in, in, uh, in Slido, which comes from a group of university students watching the, these presentations, which is great that we, we have them interested in a career. Um, they are looking for advice on how to build a career in this field or how can we become one of the humans in the loop? So perhaps start with Ross on that one. Yep. Um, I think what I would say is that um, it, is, it is still an emerging market. So there's there's num numerous things in place. Uh, as I say, Mass People is looking at the skills within the UK. There's an apprenticeship group looking to, to develop an apprenticeship to give that route specifically into this industry um, but unfortunately for the time being as I, as I was hopefully got across is that the skills which are going to be required are still at the moment the skills of the past um, and it's an additional skill which which takes it to the next level so what I would say is if you're interested in the marine environment um, look for look for officer the watch training courses which can give you a, an, un, un, um, an unlimited license to drive ships um, if it's one of the other sectors, which I think the other people don't know, and they're calling no more about the me's, um, look at a degree that in the field that you're interested in, and then and then come and look for grow up later on, and hopefully we've got a, a route into one of these paths that will um, inspire you, and we can get you to where to that point where you are that human in the loop. Yeah, I'd, uh, I'd also say stay engaged with IMRS. Um, hopefully, we we can get some careers, things going for, for the younger guys and bring in industry to, to really define what skills are needed. Um, and hopefully we've done that a little with the careers matrix. Would anyone else like to speak to that question? Ed? Yeah, maybe just a brief moment. I think we, we need a lot of skills, right? So yeah. I think uh, as long as you're driven and you're willing to contribute on the mission to, to build out more renewable energy, I think uh, take a shot and uh, probably you will get pretty far in the, in the industry as well. Maybe one overarching theme, which is getting more and more important is of course the, the, the whole data aspect of it and data management, data processing, data analytics, uh, which is a, a growing field uh, and which is getting increasingly important also to do more work with less people. I think that's also maybe something to take into account and, and, and that that's a, a way to shortcut the, the, the shortage of people that we have in general in this industry. Yeah, certainly. I'd, I'd say as well that 
there are a whole range of careers in lots of different areas in this sector. So don't be put off if you're not an engineer uh, or um, consenting, someone with consenting interest, just, yeah, there are lots of different opportunities. Um, definitely get engaged with IMR REST, also IEMA, the Energy Institute, the Chartered Institute of Water and Environmental Management. They can all provide lots of useful resources. Um, I'm REST at the top of the list, of course. Um, and take initiative and have the, um, yeah, do, do reach out to people and um, make contact with, with, um, with, with industry contacts that you may have. I think in most instances, or all instances, I'm sure we'd, we'd love to hear from you. And um, yeah, just uh, good, good luck. It's, a, it's an exciting growth industry and uh, I'm sure you've, you've all got exciting careers ahead if you pick offshore wind um, as your, your career path. I think uh, an interesting statistic is that I think the Global Wind Energy Council came up with a figure of nearly half a million people required to be trained. And that was back in 2019 before uh, a lot more commitments were made in, in terms of the gigawatts going in. So it is a large industry. Uh, the ORE Catapult just published a report that said 32,000 in the UK for floating offshore wind by 2040. So opportunities abound. <laughs> right, let's move on. Um, Richard, this one was for you. Uh, you haven't addressed any floating wind challenges. What would you say are the key ones? Uh, hi, thank you. Yes, um, so I saw something new today on Ross's presentation that I really liked that kind of summarizes where I think we are with floating, the uh, Gartner hype cycle. Um, and it shows the uh, peak of inflated expectations. Um, and I think right now we're probably approaching the peak of that, that curve with uh, floating wind. So, I mean, I see quite a lot of parallels with uh, fixed bottom back in 2010 when the Crown Estate round three results were announced and people were talking about 30 gigawatt by um, by 2020 uh, to be installed in the UK. And then we had the trough of disillusionment when the cost didn't come down and uh, everybody who made investments, some people made investments at that stage. Uh, there, there was um, people going bust, uh, people withdrawing their investments. And then the cost came down. We had this slope of enlightenment when we scaled up and got the uh, the turbines getting larger. And now we're at the plateau of productivity. But So I think that's a great analogy, that chart, and I'll be using it a lot. Uh, but with regards to, so with the floating, is it hasn't really got that, easy slope of enlightenment that fixed bottom had because we already have the cost savings of the turbines yeah that's already kind of baked in if you like in the current costs for um for floating and uh, so we saw the announcements today from the uk allocation round and i worked it out it's about 125 euros a megawatt hour the price um which and there was 32 megawatts so it's not a massive amount um it's great it's, but it's a little bit disappointing i would imagine uh, in terms of volume um so it's got a long way to go and there's a lot of hype we've seen some luck some progress in high wind um uh, my feeling is it's going to be slower than people are expecting because of the simple size and the, the opportunity for cost reduction uh it's going to be difficult getting the the units are massive they weigh um uh well eight thousand tons or more they take currently they take a lot longer to build than a monopile which can be built in a day um and it will take you a month or two to build a floater uh so we really need to get those processes going and speed it up i don't want to sound like a doom merchant because um, there is a, a lot of opportunity for it. Um, uh, and we heard from Ed, I think, about the fact that it can access resources other places can't go. Uh, the fixed bottom can't go, and it's easier to consent, probably, less damaging on the environment. 
uh, and there simply will come a point where there's no option. And when we reach that point with all the alternative business models I've talked about in the future, uh, I think floating will really come into its own and that's where we'll hit that plateau of productivity. But I think that's a way off yet. Okay, thanks, Richard. Do, do, do you think one of the challenges is that the, the turbine manufacturers are really looking to, to increase the size of the fixed turbines and not really investing perhaps in the control systems for floating? Um, I don't think they really see the... Um, I think that's part of the problem, but I don't see that as the main challenge. I see the who's going to pay for these high costs in the meantime as the main challenge. And I think that until, I mean, some of they are, are have invested a little, uh, to some extent, but I think that until they see a kind of clearer route to market on that and volume, they will always be driven by a, a commercial decision. Um, and I just think that, yeah, that, that will come, but it's going to take a little bit of time. I think we need to, we need to see a bit of uh, progress on the difficult jobs of, of building them, getting them out installed in the water at a decent rate and for a decent cost. Great, thanks. Also, uh, just on that note, sorry. Um, okay. uh, I do think that, if we were to design floating wind from scratch, I don't think we'd be doing it how we're doing it. I don't think that we would see basically oil and gas platforms with a, uh, an onshore turbine on top. I, I think there would, I mean, that's a bit cynical, but um, that's the sort of fundamental of the design. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, some of the more innovative designs that we're seeing um, may be designed from first principles, um, such as the downwind X1, uh, that type of design is more optimised and may ultimately leapfrog in the long term. Is that mainly due to fabrication costs? Yeah, the, the structure is lighter. Um, so that brings down the costs a lot and a lot less forces on the structure. So it should be easier in the long run to install and fabricate. But right now it faces all those um, challenges of it hasn't been adopted. So it's not I've got the turbines, hasn't got the um, the industry behind it, et cetera. Okay. Um, we'll move on to the next question, which is von Fawata. Uh, how can we use this technology in our operations? And perhaps you could talk to both uh, fixed structures and floating. Yeah, so basically the, the USV is uh, designed for any kind of uh, survey and inspection work. Uh, so all your subsea activities uh, we can do with the USV. Um, we tend to combine it also with our structural monitoring expertise. Uh, so essentially uh, actually using insights from, from structural monitoring to optimize uh, your inspection regime as well. Um, so yeah, it's, Happy to, to talk about this in a bit more detail. I mean, uh, it, it's good if you just can look me up on LinkedIn and then we maybe can have a, a dedicated chat on, on how we specifically apply this in, in, in your wind farm. Uh, but typically, uh, yeah, all the subsea work we can uh, we can do with the USB. Great. Uh, worth noting that uh, Stuart Kilburn of Fugro gave a, a talk on the work they did on high wind and the structural monitoring. So that, that is actually in the in the IMRS TV uh, catalog, if you're interested in that side of things. Um, it's, it's yeah, so maybe a bit connected then to the next uh, question. That's what are the, so, uh, some of the challenges around the, the USV? Yeah. I, I think the key challenge, uh, technically speaking, is that uh, you see that a lot of USVs are designed for a single purpose. And actually, the USB that we put out in the market has it has a multi-purpose, so we can do multiple things at the same time, which has a big advantage of uh, when you're out there, you can do uh, bigger scopes of work, uh, so you don't need to come back that often to the same site. Uh, but it co of course comes with the technical challenges that everything needs to uh, communicate and, and and talk together, uh, which uh, takes a bit more time actually. Uh, uh, to iron out all those uh, challenges and make sure that, that the system is also reliable and that you can also optimize the, uh, uh, the USB operations uh, in general. Um, the other element which I think should not be overlooked is the regulatory element, right? We're still struggling to get 
the uh, uh, all let's say regulatory regulatory papers in place uh, uh, to actually uh, yeah go beyond the horizon with the USV uh, in any country that we want. Um, we are getting there, uh, but it has been a, a, a long road actually to convince the, the regulator, uh, well, the regulatory bodies basically and authorities uh to yeah prove that actually that, that the usv is safe to operate and that we have uh done all our homework to make sure that uh um, yeah that we tick all the boxes of the of the regulator so so at the moment you're operating under the national regulatory system rather than um yeah so we are expecting uh, a full mca appro approval in september october more or less uh, after that, we can do uh, full over the horizon, uh, beyond the horizon uh, operations in any country around the world. But at the moment, we're operating under local exemptions. Yes. Okay. Great. Or closer to safe haven, right? Uh, it's also an option. Uh, here's one for you, Richard. Given your background in fisheries, could you share your thoughts on co location of fishing and offshore wind? major challenge in South Korea. You're on mute. <laughs> so yes, um, that was a while ago I was involved in marine fisheries. Um, <laughs> but I get my excuses in now. That is, uh, and in South, South Africa, doing uh, we're doing vessel monitoring systems there. Okay. Um, oh, but there's no doubt about it. In uh, APAC, so particularly South Korea, the uh, fishing is is a big challenge, um, and Japan, where the fishing um, the fishermen have a lot of rights and are can easily slow projects and stop projects. Um, so I don't really have any particular comment apart from the fact that it is like a number one uh, number one problem in that part of the world. Okay, thanks. Maybe, maybe if I may uh, add to this point, sure. in, mm. I think also in Europe, you see that it's getting more and more important, right? Uh, so I think the key thing that we at least are investigating is, is how can we increase also the, the monitoring efforts throughout the lifetime? And also how can you design your subsea structures in such a way that it has a positive effect on, on, on fish population, right? So at the moment, uh, we're actually involved in a subsidy application to uh, to look into the concept of uh, ecological DNA measurements uh, combined with uh, some alternative scour protection options or uh, cable crossing options uh, and in that way actually um, yeah develop some proof points that actually uh, it can be a good thing to have a wind farm uh, there uh, because it will have a positive effect on your fish populations in general yeah I think you can in you can have a positive impact, but then uh, you also have the, the issue of how the fishermen might then <laughs> take, take those and uh, impacts on cables, etc. Yeah, it's a, it's a change management process, right? So I yeah. think it's, uh, yeah. But maybe you'll be uh, also monitoring large offshore mariculture <laughs> structures in the future too. Um, here's one for you, Ed, which is asking how would you address the current significant skill shortages? What do you think would be most effective? I think, I think um, looking to universities is, is, is one thing, and I think that courses are increasingly becoming more tightly focused on um, the careers that are available in the offshore wind industry, which is absolutely great. Um, but I'd suggest that Given the scale of the, the the sort of potential shortage, it's it's probably going sort of further further back than than that. Um, so I know there have been sort of various industry outreach programs going into um, into schools, and I think that that's really really important and, and getting that that early early interest um, sparked. Um, and then yeah, kind of jumping onto some of the points that we we talked about earlier regarding getting involved with professional bodies early, attending industry events, things like this week at IMRS. I think it, you know, that kind of continual professional development is is really key. Um, yeah. Yeah, it, it's very interesting. Uh, when I've attended careers days at my, when my daughter was uh, going through this process, 
I asked about the marine sector in totality and there wasn't one piece of information available at the local careers person. So I've been going into the schools now for quite a few years and doing that, those careers. And I, I would really encourage anyone else who has connections with schools to actually reach out to them. Um, quite often it's a single person coordinating the careers fairs across an area. So uh, you, you can get good penetration. Ed, you've got your hand up. Yeah, it's just very, very brief one. Um, just talking about environmental impacts earlier around um, floating offshore wind or around offshore wind. Um, just very, very briefly share my screen. Hopefully the IMRS can send a link around to this. Um, but floating offshore wind, I think one of the risks that is related to it is the perception that that, that different technology might have a, a greater environmental impact. Um, um, and it's yeah almost the concern around the, the unknown. Actually, in reality, lots of the technologies that are involved with floating offshore wind um, kind of have their roots in, in oil and gas and um, North Sea activity that's, that's been going on for decades. Um, the offshore renewable energy catapult looked into this topic in quite some detail in this public report, which has been recently published. Um, so hopefully the IMRS can, can share that around after today. But if you search environmental interactions roadmap, you should be able to should be able to find it. We'll, we'll put that into a nexus for all, all the members. Super. I can hopefully stop sharing my screen now. There we go. Yeah. Uh, another one for you, Richard. Which countries do you think are going to struggle the most to meet their offshore wind ambition? Um, well, there's, I mean, there's a few candidates. Um, there's some that have struggled in the past, and there's a good example is one because I've basically spent. 10 years delaying projects in our da database and uh, some countries have been uh, difficult to manage. France is an example of how it can be difficult if you haven't got all your consenting and community engagement lined up. The What happened there is the industry got delayed so long, uh, plus there was rules about local content that um, actually they had to re-calculate uh, all the subsidies after seven years of delay so there's a real lesson in there on how how to learn from other countries um you see uh, one of the things i referred to is goals that aren't actually substantiated so they're just like political ambitions really and we've seen some evidence of that slow movers at the start in india for example is is one that uh, stands out um that has a big 2030 target that's not achievable um we um, slightly concerned about some of the South uh, European markets at the moment um, who are making a lot of noises about floating wind in particular. Um, but I'm talking about lease activity uh, and fairly imminent targets in the mid 2020s that, you know, just don't really, that we I expect to be delaying. Um, Portugal has some quite ambitious ones, for example. Um, so new targets really where people uh haven't been through necessarily the learning curve um the us has been through a long learning curve and we see that coming to fruition now so it's it's easy to sort of jump on the hype but really you've got to go through that pain barrier of engaging everybody um to actually get through that and get the get the progress even taiwan started off quite well but that's that's run into a few headaches right Okay, thanks. I, I was going to ask a question of my own, um, which relates to data and geo information, basically. Um, we, given the types timescales of these projects, a lot of the data collection happens after license award. Um, and that gives a very small window to collect the data that's required. Uh, do, do you see benefits in creating things like multi-client services to uh, undertake geophysical wind resource survey, potentially environmental survey, either with 
through the regulator or through um, interested parties to, to really accelerate things? Uh, that's an open question to anybody. Yeah, I, I would definitely see the benefits of actually uh, coordinating that more centrally. I think um, one of the reasons I think that the, the rollout of, of offshore wind in Denmark was so successful was because they centralized uh, a lot of the survey work. Uh, I think it's also when the Netherlands changed to that system as well, you saw a, a rapid increase, I think, of the, on the offshore wind build out. Uh, and it reduces some of the, 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 the waste in the supply chain um, by not having to redo any of the survey work. Uh, so also there, there, there are benefits of, uh, of avoiding double work, which in the end will benefit the level less cost of energy. Yeah, that, that sort of ties in with another question that I can see in Slido, which uh, you say, no, are there enough vessels in the world to do the survey work? <laughs> um, yeah, at the moment, uh, maybe if, if, if I can react to maybe Ross, you could say also something about it. But I think we have to decline work because we don't have enough vessels. Uh, it's, it's also because of the combination, right? We see a, a rapid increase in oil and gas, uh, which combined with a rapid increase in, in, in offshore wind, uh, which leads to uh, to a temporary shortage. Um, but at the same time, you also see that, that we are investing heavily in, uh, in remote uh, solutions, uh, remote vessels, remote survey uh, uh, USVs. Others are doing it as well. So there's also coming more and more capacity on the market. Uh, but if you want to, for example, geotechnical vessels, that, that's still also a, a, a challenge in terms of capacity. Okay, um, I've been reminded that we're meant to finish at half past. I, I think what I'll do now is just round, round up uh, the, the event. Um, first of all, thank you to all the speakers for some very interesting thoughts. Um, some key things coming out, I think, are the size of the opportunity, both to individuals who want to um, work in the sector and the opportunities available for people to, to engage in the sector for companies who are working in the sector uh, and also for our environment, because without this offshore wind, we're not going to meet the, the net zero. Uh, so we really need to keep pushing this forward with, with all our efforts and re really make things happen. Um, the other one is the skill shortage. Um, how we overcome that is going to be critical. I, I think a more concerted effort maybe both at a, a, a national and a global level is required there to, to really bring people up to speed. Uh, you know, we, we see a lot of people being tempted by developers from both the regulators and contractors and uh, consultants, and that, that creates a, a bit of a, a brain drain towards the developer side, which leaves a hole for the people who might actually be executing the work. So we, we, that needs uh, some thought about how that might work going forward. Um, it's great to see the innovation on offer that uh, Walter talked about. I was involved in the nascent discussions on that when I was at Fugro. So it's, it's great to see that come into fruition and uh, I wish you every success with that. Um, I think also the, the, the skills side of things that Ross talked about and actually really uh, coming up with a clear plan of what's needed be, because that's one of the challenges is technology moves so quickly what skills are required and how do people in, interact with technology so uh, that was a really nice thing to talk through and then from Ed on, on the consenting side lots of challenges there particularly to get things moving quickly I, I think the the recent move for the Crown Estate to to actually take, undertake more data collection and uh, really engage with developers early in the piece it is really good. So um, with that, I'd like to thank all our speakers and wish you good afternoon, good evening or good morning. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be. Bye-bye. Thanks all. Bye-bye.